Okay, beautiful. Are you recording? Anyone? Hmm. Note that I believe we also have a Michael Rogers on this call with some package manager ideas he's been thinking about. Nice. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, hello. I was just thinking last night that I don't know if I updated the uh, agenda somewhere ever. So I was like, oh yeah, we should probably go through the you know things we want to do for the week and then leave time for anyone to chat about anything they'd like. Uh, like Michael, welcome. So we can do that. Um, in this view, it's a little hard to tell if it's actually recording or not. Can anyone see? If, has it got the little button? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so it is the Tuesday, uh, August 22nd, or 27, um, Package Managers Weekly Call, also sprint planning. Um, so we'll kick things off. Let's see. Uh, can someone, how about, we'll do that thing where you, you uh, call out the next person to let them uh, let us know what they're doing next. But for the first bit, I will say I see uh, Adine. Congratulations. <laughs> Can make you say a thing first. <laughs> How's your week looking? Uh, week is week is looking okay. Um, basically, going to be continuing from sort of the uh, continuing stuff from last week on building the discovery stuff into PubSub. Um, hopefully, I'll have the how to do discovery things working uh i have a draft of that out today and then tomorrow can start on can you know work on all right let's polish up the pub sub part of things um that's okay. uh, 82 is the one you're looking at okay is this the one or no uh that's 81, 81. the next one kidding. yeah kidding. Oh, it's on the main one. Do you want, yeah. is it useful to break off the discovery stuff into a separate issue? Nah. Okay. Uh, be able to close things. So if you want to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, well, the reason why this one is there's no closing anything here is that these are, unless I want to duplicate all of the ones that are in like go IPFS here. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. These are just links to other issues. Right. And I was going to try it. Sorry, all my, like I said, I'm not feeling super great so my brain's a little slow um i am going to try to get see if i can put in the go ipfs uh thingy into here we'll see if it's the only other one might be okay cross your fingers well it's yeah it's go ipfs and go the p2p it's like it's it's a bunch of stuff so yeah. eh, for the time being be nice we'll see uh cool thank you yeah you get to choose your successor all right uh Cool. Uh, Dominic, what's what's up? Hey, y'all. So uh, basically, I've just been, um, lately, I've been thinking about how to take the work that I've been doing and put it into a like reviewable PR. Um, so what that means for at least today is I'm going through like the IPFS config stuff and just adding experimental flags and, and basically just hooking up the stuff that's been um, done already. And then I'm going to take that and, you know, just basically uh, try and come up with some way of testing it, um, whether it's like conventional tests or something external. Um, we were talking about using FSX, which is a file system uh, exerciser, I think is what the X is for. Um, but that that's something I have to look at, like going going forward today. Um, the config stuff's pretty obvious, and then after that, I kind of have to think of which which of the things that have been discussed in some of the other issues, like the epic there, um, or even in um, some of the research stuff. Basically, what is the most pressing issue to get us towards something we can have that will be like r syncable? Um, in my opinion, I guess that's probably going to be metadata, some some method of having metadata storage on the node yeah. um, and managing it. Um, so that's something I have to look into. Uh, it's probably going to be something um, specific to this rather than like a Unix FS v2 or v1.5 kind of thing, um, just because of the nature of how this is going to have to work. Uh, but yeah, that's a lengthy update for me. Um, let's see. 
anyone have any questions on that before we yeah. bounce? Just a brief question on like what your what your time looks like once uh, Hugo lands the IPNS over DNS spec and if you need help with stuff. Totally. So uh, I'm mostly just waiting on that. Um, once it's there, we already have some kind of, I don't know what you want to call it. It's an unfinished thing that does, it works with the prototypes that's, that's there. But since it's not standard, it's not spec compliant or anything, um, it would just probably be a matter of adapting that to fit this, this spec and, and write tests for it. Um, it's a little hard to do that now since we only have that one experimental name server that doesn't, the values and keys are backwards on that one for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, once we standardize it, I think it's just fixing that up and it, it shouldn't take too much time. It depends on how involved we're gonna be with the spec work and all that. Um, Let's see. So, um, anything else? A, yeah, follow up question. When do you think you'll you uh, need input, or are you good for a little bit? When you're saying, "Ah, oh, yeah, what we need to talk about what would make sense to do next." Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I guess I will put a I'll put a p up a PR up first for some of the the work that should be reviewed, like the technical stuff, and then I guess if you want to call it design or direction or something like that that should probably go into a new issue of this same type, like uh, like number 74 there, something of that size. And we can just talk about it as we go on, I guess. Sounds like a plan. Or, you know, always feel free to reach out to anyone on the team. Definitely. We're not right. on the team. Bother everybody. Go ahead. <laughs> no problems with that one. Um, all right. Let's see. Dirk, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so last week, myself and Stephen uh, worked on this new BitSwap proposal. And uh, so I kind of put together an issue that's sort of like a draft version of it. Um, <clears throat> and we've solicited comments. So Hannah's made a few comments there. And uh, in the meantime, I'm implementing a proof of concept. I want to try to get to a point where I can benchmark it and make sure that it's actually going to going to have the improvements that we're expecting. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to get a benchmark out by the end of the week. And in the meantime, um, our, like, our partner has been putting together a really, really nice test suite that's going to be uh, demoed later today. Uh, so once that's, once that's kind of ready to go, we can, we can actually do some benchmarks in, like, with real machines on AWS. Any questions about that? All right, Alex, you want to go next? Sure. So I've been um, trying to uh, carry this async iterate, like adding async iterators to JSRPFS uh, PR uh, over the line. Um, so it was a big, big PR, um, which I broke up into a bunch of small ones. So the small ones have all been merged. I've rebased the uh, async iterator, adding async iterators one. Um, uh, and it, like the tests along with JSW, that's passed, but the interface tests don't pass because it needs uh, a new version of the HTTP client, which then depends on um, some other stuff that needs to be merged. But to update, the uh, like so it's the the that like the IPFS DCTL module, which is what how the tests spin up and tear down daemon so that it uses to run the tests uh, work. So that has been ported to async iterators, and there's a PR outstanding on JS IPFS to pull that in, um, but it's failing on Windows because Windows. Um, Basically, there's like a bunch of outstanding work that needs to be done to pull it over the line. Uh, and I feel quite bad about just dumping all that on Alan's lap um, because he's only human and only has two hands uh, to type with. So, yeah, I'm going to try and finish that off, which is annoying because I was hoping to pick up the Go IPFS ad performance improvements. Um, but I just don't think it can leave the code base in the state that it's in because we have all this stuff backing up and it's getting really hard to upgrade things. Um, so that's probably going to be me. Any questions? Mm 
No, wish I could be more helpful. I have two hands, but they don't do those things. <laughs> Uh, cool. Stephen, do you want to go? I have the dad. Michael, do you want to tell us about the work that you've been up to? Sure, sure. Um, should we pull up the doc? Is everybody done with, with this section though? I don't want to like interrupt your, your whole sort of regular meeting flow. Um, All right, I suppose I but, should give a quick update, I suppose. Sorry, it, uh, yeah. Stephen, it took me a second to parse what you actually said. That's why there was a long pause. Thank you, Molly, for, <laughs> for filling in. <laughs> so here, I'll give my quick thing, which is just that. Um, same as last week, making progress on all of this. We, we always have a bunch of small like get backs or whatever from uh, retro and I'm going through all of our old retro docs to make sure those have happened and I have um, um, and so for this week there's let's see I think there's an issue for this okay we've got the package manager okay our thing which is so close and Molly I saw your note about scoring so we'll get to that this week um, and maybe there's an issue I need to make one but uh, updating the the readme and other documentation around what we do to include the uh, just what we've been up to this this quarter, and make that a bit clearer, because the the we've there's been an open action from the beginning of the um, quarter to turn you know the is the repo is no longer just kind of a research repo. We've got some other things going on, so let's make sure that's updated and people can be clear about what we're doing. Um, yep, so I've got something started here on my computer, but I'll put in a PR on that hopefully soon when. Um, my lymph nodes aren't going crazy. Anyways, uh, okay, any questions for me or things that, excuse me, that you um, would like me to move up on my to-do list? Okie dokie. And then uh, Molly, I don't know if you had anything to update the team on, or like you said, we can, uh, pass it over to Michael and he can share what he's he's up to. Yeah, I think let's hop over to Michael. I don't have any anything pressing on my end. Got it. Beautiful. Hi Michael. What do you need? You're on mute. Sorry. Sorry, I got lost there for a second in, in iPad Windows. Um yeah, should I share my screen with the doc for a second? Sure. Um, stop mine. Cool, cool. Um, There's supposed to be a window that comes up. Okay, well, my screen sharing is broken right now. So, okay. Cool. Yay, okay. iOS. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, hold on. Let me grab a link for it. Um, yep. I think I actually need to turn on link sharing first. Um, I should do that anyway. Oh, Molly got a thing. Is that what you wanted? Yeah, um, I just turned on, oh, yep, there we go. Yeah, that works, okay. So the the uh, the long short of it is that um, there there's a pretty big migration right now that's gonna have to happen in the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, so there's about a million modules in NPM, uh, which is a lot. Um, and there is now a module standard for the browser. And people have been like, quote unquote, using this module standard for a long time through compilers. And so it gets a little complicated to sort of keep in your head like that this is actually like a rather new thing in terms of people using it natively in the browser and writing modules that work natively without a compile tool chain. But that's always been the intention of the standard is to you know enable browsers to have a native module system that doesn't require extra tooling in order to load things. Um, if you try to use it today, you you end up in this weird box where you actually can't use anything from NPM, including all the stuff that is quote unquote like in the new module standard, because all of it assumes that you're running it through a compile tool chain. It actually breaks if you try to use it natively in the browser, which is quite interesting. Um, this kind of provides an interesting opportunity in that 
you kind of need a new registry and a new sort of package management flow for this new style of module. For one thing, um, if you do it right, a package registry could open up every module ever created without a sort of install step, without like a, a sort of package management step. You could just like rely on it, essentially. It could just be like available as, as the moment that it's published, um, which is a very different flow than any of the JavaScript package managers have right now, including NPM. And because there's such a small selection, but I mean, I think the selection is probably zero right now of stuff in NPM that actually works natively in this environment. It's not a stretch to, to build a new registry for it because it has such a different flow and because you know, you're actually, there is kind of a compatibility break that's gonna happen here. Um, I had done some experiments with this thing called bundle sync, um, which the idea was that if we wrap it in, like using some IPFS technologies, but not all of IPFS, um, we could wrap and encode the chunks and then move around like this list of parts um, for bundles rather than loading JavaScript bundles in the browser. This is like sort of the, the old way of compile tool chains. One of the things that I noticed that kind of breaks down in our stack is that th the moment that you start running stuff through compressors, Rabin just doesn't get, Rabin is not as good. Um, and in order to get like sufficient deduplication out of Rabin, you have to like bring down the chunk size. And then that means that the the description of the data is actually quite large because you have like a very long list of hashes because there's so many small parts. Um, and then it doesn't kind of justify itself. The amazing thing about this new module standard is that like nobody is compressing and minifying these modules like they just load up natively in the browser. So we can rabbit encode them really effectively and it shows a lot of the duplication benefits that we have. The problems with this module standard are that like there are all these glaring performance issues <laughs> that the, the the advocates of the module system and the browser vendors are saying look like people can solve this at the transport layer they keep just saying like people will figure out how to solve this at the transport layer effectively uh what they think is is that like some very fancy server side thing will start using http2 and push in order to sort of prefetch all of these modules um nobody's actually built this yet like like i've seen demos that sort of show that it doesn't work that well but i'm like nobody's actually like doing doing this yet um what, what we could do is something different that's sort of in between. So we can solve the performance issues in a similar way, but do it actually in the client and a service worker where we have a local, effectively like an IPFS data store. Um, and I'll get into sort of like how this separates from, from all of IPFS in a second, but like an IPFS data store in the service worker that would be able to pull down all these modules and do all the rabid diffing and do all, all the prefetching. So it could solve these performance issues and you would get really efficient deduplication. And you could get stuff that we, we don't have at all on the web right now, like background updates, right? So when you update your application, we could get all of those assets in the background while the application is running or while the service worker is running. And by the time you load the new application, the code is just there. Um, so this could solve like a lot of like kind of common performance issues um, using a lot of our technology. So anything in the critical path that would affect page load would have to be pulled out of a central service. So even though we're using like a, like a Unix FS and kind of IPLD underneath the hood, we would need like a point to point protocol that's very, very fast because anything that would um, increase the page load time is like noticeable user performance issues. But once we have the initial code, once we have like what was effectively loaded from a cold start, we can serve those, those files that were loaded in the IPFS network and all of that in update infrastructure, which I think over time would probably end up being the majority of the actual transfer, um, like data transfer, that could actually live in the IPFS network because none of that would cause any noticeable user lag. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting opportunity for us if we, if we want to kind of go after it. Um, it's a little bit greenfield. We know that the space is going to expand really dramatically. Um, and you know, even if we didn't get like some giant market share, I think that we would end up exposing a lot of developers to the primitives that, that we've been building. Um, but yeah, that was sort of the, this, this idea that I landed on and tried to write up here. There's like a lot of background and a lot of kind of technical details of like why NPM isn't just gonna port easily to this um, that I've tried to write up succinctly, but I'm sure that there's some details missing and some questions that people have. Hand from Michelle. <laughs> since you can't see me because mm -hmm. I'm sick. Uh, so, when, so, so the work, I would, mm, what am I trying to say? Uh, this quarter, we've been focusing on some of the core um, IPFS performance issues that are preventing other, you know, 
mm. plus from engaging with other package manager work is is mm. do you know if taking this route is essentially different or if the, it seems to me we'd have the same performance issues and we need to solve those anyways i'm not sure what a uh yeah have you uh gone um, a different path if this is a different path um or if it's the uh kind of same sort of thing i think it would end up changing more next quarter than this quarter um so it's it sort of it needs unix v2 um for for some complicated issues that I can get into with Codex in, in a little bit. Um, it, it really needs Unix SV2 to be performant. Um, and I'm working on Unix SV2 anyway, and like plan to have a JavaScript version by the end of the quarter. And that's kind of like the main prerequisite for this working. Um, as far as the other performance work porting, any performance work in JS IPFS would certainly port. Um, but none of this is using the Go infrastructure, um, or like Go IPFS at any point. So. Um, none of that would directly translate over, but it's not like that would be wasted work at all. Um, and then I think some of the issues that other package managers are dealing with um, may not be the same problems that we're dealing with here. I, I'm not like, I'm not as deep into all of those priorities, um, but certainly any any performance work or features that were added on the JSIPFS side would probably port over pretty well. And and obviously all of the Unix two work will port over. another hand if no one has one, but I'm going to see if anyone else has thoughts. Uh, looks like a Dean hand raised. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm not 100% sure I, I grasp all what's going on here. So just like <laughs> clarifying a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Is the idea basically just to have your, your browser like fetch and basically like just cache updates for you? Are cache like blocks for you based on their hashes? Is that like the the TLDR for like instead no. of fetch? Yeah. No. Well, so what happens is that the so an an import basically like a, a module import in the browser turns into an HTTP fetch basically like an HTTP GET call. Um, we can intercept that in the service worker and then turn that into like you know a call into effectively MFS like a immutable file instance. Um, locally, like a, in a local cache. So it's using like effectively IPFS to, to say like for this URL space, all these files are going to come out of IPFS. And since we know that all of these, like because we own this publishing point, we know that they're all being rabbit chunked and, and, and all of that. Um, we know that there's going to be actually like very efficient chunking by hash of all these files, if that makes sense. Um, and because we own the publishing point, we can do stuff like when a module gets published, look at the import graph and then if somebody is doing a cold start we can ask we can we can basically say like do like a, a sort of graph sync style request over that import graph so just hand me everything that you know that i'm going to need if i don't have a cache for this whole file um which is the thing that all of the esm advocates have been saying needs to be built that nobody has built yet but they're all thinking of it as sort of like a server side push thing rather than like this much more advanced sort of caching infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to like think a little bit about whether the people who are trying to solve this not in IPFS, IPLD land, are just gonna rely on like um, I forget what they're called. Basically, like the the signed signed assets to just have cached signed assets and get like a good chunk of the benefits of not so much more work. What do you mean there? Well, because I mean, if the if the idea is just like I have to fetch things, I'll fetch them over HTTP from somewhere, then I'll have ha I'll have I'll have hashed things so I know that they're the same across various different websites. Whenever I need a module, then even without like IPLD and multi formats, you you can still get like. Right, there's like a standard for getting like for getting like hashed objects um, from no no webpack. Uh, it's you're talking about web packaging. Web packaging yeah, I'm talking about the yeah. yeah the like assets that are assets that are like hashed and signed. Yeah, so that's a different standard that is currently stalled. Um, 
So that was developed by Google. Um, it, it's effectively a way to take what they do um, in AMP and sort of turn it, or what they want to do for AMP and turn it into a web standard that's a little bit more generic. Um, but what, what, if, what effectively what it does is it, it uses the SSL certificate to sign a bunch of individual HTTP assets and then hand them to you in one big bundle. So that gives you HTTP level resource caching at the file level. It doesn't give you deduplication within the files like we get with wrap and chucking. So we still have like a performance upgrade over that for certain. Um, and as far as like us maybe leveraging web packaging, I don't see a huge benefit. If, if we have the service worker there and we can already get like, you know, an entire sort of asset tree um, and and even within that asset tree, we have the duplication. I wouldn't. I don't see why we would end up using web packaging. And and like I said, the standard is actually stalled because um, Mozilla is objecting to it, like on principle. So um, I don't actually. I don't think that that's going to go anywhere. Um, D, uh, Dietrich has been a little bit more involved in that, I think. Um, and Jim Pick, I think, has been involved in it too. But. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so Michelle's uh, question, what's the biggest only point to a package manager maintainer and a package manager consumer? So the, the biggest benefit to a consumer is that they don't have to use a quote unquote package manager. Like there, there is no pull this down and run it into my compile chain step. It's literally like I, I just start using modules and I can use anything in the entire industry. So it, it's like actually a really nice, much better workflow um, from a web developer perspective on their end. As long as you can solve these performance problems that, that, that are there with ESM, then it's, it's a huge benefit to them and a much easier sort of package consumption experience. Um, on the package, for, I think package manager maintainer, that would be us in this case. I think pa pa package maintainers are certainly an audience though like package maintainers that people publishing packages. And I mean, the benefit to them literally is that, you know, it's very easy for anybody to now use their new package. Um, I think like early in a new ecosystem like this, the incentives are a little bit different than they are in like a long running system. I think that like, if you have something new that's using a lot of like newer technologies, a lot of the people that show up are actually the people that want, that are like interested in greenfield spaces and want to publish the first packages in that space. Like, you know, like I think that you know the, the first people that like you know do their web framework all in this new style, you know, will get you know some cool points or whatever, and uh, that attracts a lot of people. We saw this in the early Node.js days too, because we also had like no packages, and everybody got to show up and write all the first stuff, um, and it attracts like a certain type of person. But I think like over time, the benefit really is that like um, this is a way for me to publish my work into a global ecosystem that is immediately accessible to every browser user in the world. Yeah, I, I really didn't figure out that this would be a thing until I started trying to actually use ESM in the browser natively um, and quickly realized that I just, I couldn't use anything from NPM, that you sort of are on your own. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, you're writing all of your own dependencies from scratch now because there is no package manager really that's only doing uh, like new style packages. Some resource integrity. I guess looking at this, there's definitely, um, it runs a little abreast of, of a anti-goal we set for ourselves in terms of um, having, having kind of large scale package manager infrastructure that we would then have to run for the foreseeable future. Um, in, in terms of the, the centralized registry component, I kind of, I have a, a spidey sense that that's going to be actually a lot more work than than the couple bullets it seems within this doc um, and that like the gateways will actually end up investing like if we if we proceed this pursue this forward and it even has like modest uptake um, continuing to to support that and make it a good experience for people and not burn them um, might might be a significant chunk of effort so that should be like, I guess, weighed <laughs> against the other, the other side of things. Yeah. Um. So I did. In um. Oh, whoops. Sorry. I, I was trying to text and it 
the chat actually only sent it to a dean, even though it was before a dean. Sorry, I'll I'll get back to that in a second to respond to Andrew. Um, so I did some of this already on Cloudflare workers um, when when I was doing the bundle sync experiment, because I was thinking like it would be nice if this was just already in a CDN, and even the sort of smart end of it was also like at an edge cache. Um, and it's just a lot less infrastructure to run because you, we're not running servers, we're not managing all of that stuff. It's just sort of like automated. Um, and it's certainly doable to, like we could do all of this with Cloudflare workers, um, definitely. You, you have to kind of pare down the number of codecs and, and hashes that you're gonna use. But since we own the publishing side of it, we can make sure that like we're not just taking arbitrary um, like blocks in. Um, However, that, that doesn't mean that there's nothing to ever manage and that there's not like a potential cost center. Um, so, and, and for instance, like I'm, I'm using the Cloudflare key value store, which is incredibly fast and really nice. And, you know, it also has a two meg block limit. So it's like really, really fits nicely inside of our stack actually. Um, but uh, one of the problems with it is that like, I, I don't know what the cost structure of that would look like over time. And if we would have to actually like move to a different storage structure and then just use cloud for workers as sort of the compute layer. As a compute layer, it's, it's pretty cheap. Um, you know, it's comparable to other serverless offerings, even though it's um, all edge. Um, so yeah, I think that it could be built in a way that would minimize our load over time, but I don't know that it can be built in a way that would minimize our cost indefinitely so we would want to look at opportunities to reduce that cost like maybe partnering with with cloudflare and saying like hey would you kind of co-sponsor this with us and host the infrastructure like something like that um i think could really help us but yeah i'm, I'm much less worried about the infrastructure maintenance side of it because we can build it this way but i am worried about the infrastructure cost still so um so yeah, Andrew. So Andrew had a comment about Pika. So Pika is awesome. I, I love them. And a lot of this, I don't. I don't think that I would have gotten to this place sort of mentally if I hadn't dug into the Pika stuff before. Um, but Pika is sort of punting on on both the registry and the transport. So Pika is trying to find modules and npm that they can sort of make work um, without a compile step, which is like a pretty minimal set. Um, and then they they're not doing anything with the transport layer. So all of the performance problems that I talked about earlier with like every individual file basically being a new round trip, that's all still an issue with Pika. Um, and they, they're, I don't think that they're even really working on that. I think that they're actually looking at like, how can they improve some of the other parts of the experience? So um, I think that if we did something interesting enough that they would end up either like using our stuff or merging with us or like, I think that there would end up being a lot of collaboration there. I don't think that they would end up competing for all that long. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't say the, the thing about Cloudflare sort of offhand either. I think that like there there may actually be a real opportunity there for, for us to partner with them. Um, they're they're really looking for like they would love it if all of new JavaScript developers were pulling from their infrastructure. They would they would definitely love that. They're they already um, the Node.js Foundation uses them as a CDN for all of um, for all of Node.js tarballs, and they provided that for free for years. So. Like they've done this before for open source projects. They're they're really into it. They also like love our technology stack and have done a bunch of sort of IP this related stuff. So it's not um, unthinkable that we could partner with them. So Michelle. Hey, yeah. Um I I want to have a chance to read your document in full and give it some thought, mm -hmm. but um I'm worried that we've spent a lot of time over the last year or so, I suppose, or two years doing some really neat you know, examples of what the future could look like. And we haven't had a chance to solve core performance issues and go IPFS and other things that are preventing like general uptake of the technology. So I'd be worried that if we add this without having more people on the team in general on IPFS to like help manage it, it'll distract mm -hmm. from just doing core like improvements to our technology that we really need to do to make it so that like not just the the folks that you were talking about, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, the people who are excited about new stuff uh, want to use it, but uh, we can mm -hmm. actually solve some problems for folks. But I um, definitely want to take a look at the doc and see what you've got there, and mm -hmm. hear what other people have to say. Yeah. Well, in terms of resourcing, this wouldn't pull anybody from 
go even if we went all in on it um, because literally all of the work is in JavaScript, um, including the, the worker stuff. Um, but I mean, you, you can still see it having a huge impact there. And it's not like we don't have the same sort of needs and wants of growth uh, yeah. more generically on the JS IPFS side. Right. So, so it definitely still applies. Um, like I said, like the, the sort of the most important parts of this are I'm going to have to build this quarter anyway. Um, and so there'll be sort of meaningful progress in that direction. Um, so we have like quite a while to just sort of like think about it and stew on it before we need to think about um, prioritizing or resourcing it or, you know, little, you know, taking anything else off of our plate or off of our priority list. Um, so, you know, I'll continue to kind of plug away at it and, and mm -hmm. maybe get something demoable. Um, and then at, at that point, um, you know, if it's something that we feel like investing in further, then we could maybe change some of the resourcing on it. But I don't think that this needs to pull away from anything that we're currently working on right now. And I don't think that it really warrants it at this stage. So. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Okay. I just want to say it's, uh, it's a really cool idea. You know, it's, uh, it's really nice that you're, you're like exploring something that's um, kind of going in a very, very ambitious direction. And I, I like the idea of uh, doing something much more efficiently than what's out there at the moment. So I definitely think it's worth, worth kind of pursuing somewhere at least to see, see how viable it is in practice. Yeah, 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 it should, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting. Um, I've been sort of disappointed that people haven't done more things on the transport layer for ESM yet. Um, and be, because like there's, they've admitted a huge collection of performance issues with it as it stands. And nobody's really worked very hard to change that. Um, and I think one of the reasons is just that everyone is stuck in this flow of compiling their modules and <laughs> like, because everybody's compiling their modules, they can't really get a lot of benefits out of this this new native system. But once you start using native modules in the browser, it, it's just it's such a nice workflow. Like it's it's really really desirable once you kind of go all in. Um, so yeah, I think that there's also some new browser standards that would make this even nicer for us. There's like this import map standard that um, can make some of the the preloading happen like immediately before even the service worker is installed and stuff like that. So things are going to keep progressing like in the web platform in a direction that like aligns and even like improves this this uh this idea. So, um, but at the same time, like I don't see anybody really working on this problem all that diligently. So it's not like we we need to change everything that we're doing and and go all in on it. Like we can keep um messing with it. Uh, yeah, I guess while. my my next question there would be um. Do you think it's something that we could get people excited about enough that they'll work on it for us? I mean, it needs to be working and then they'll work on it with us. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> it, it needs to like be a thing that people can actually use. And then I think, yeah, a lot of people I think would help out. Um, like there are parts of it that I'm not as worried about doing a ton of development on, like, you know, making the, the command line, you know, have a bunch of cool features, like people will fill that part in. I'm not worried about that. I'm much more worried about like, let's just get sort of a basic publishing and consumption flow down and get the infrastructure working um, and to a point where it sort of scales easily. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's some stuff about Tink and Entropic. So I've actually, I've talked with Isaac quite a bit about Tink because um, we, we still hang out every few months. Um, so one of the things that is, is going to weigh NPM down in this transition is that the moment that you use any of the existing sort of million modules from NPM from one of these new style modules, you now can't use the new style module natively because part of it's like the depth tree now has this thing in it that actually needs a compile step. Um, so it's it's more of an ecosystem problem. It's actually it's very similar to to the issues that um, like you know Python has had for years trying to adopt like new concurrency patterns, which is that they have this huge ecosystem of modules that use blocking I/O, and then when you try to use non-blocking I/O, you you're like now in this corner of the ecosystem. And the moment that you use one of these, you like break your entire sort of service. Um, and so like th they're going to have a very similar problem um, getting like the, the existing NPM ecosystem to function well with like a native um, ecosystem. And yeah, Entropic is sort of built on content I like, I mean, we, we can get more into Entropic 
at some point, but I, I'm not going to put a lot of faith in that project for a variety of reasons. Like, I don't think that that's really going to go anywhere. Um, like, you know, more power to them if they, if they do. Um, I mean, they're not, the, how do I feel about the maintainers? They're not the people that I would choose to do that. <laughs> um, like, they're not great at, like, building a community or working with others or growing an ecosystem. Um, <laughs> but um yeah i i don't know um yeah i mean i've worked with them on a lot of stuff they're very smart engineers um but i i don't like it's very hard to see a hard break in the npm ecosystem for any reason other than like um npm literally failing like like literally just going offline or collapsing entirely um you know, I, like I've seen people try to replace like, you know, Ruby package managers and Python package managers and, and often doing like a lot of like better features and stuff like that. And, and at the end of the day, they make sort of a dent. Um, I mean, we saw this a little bit with Yarn, right? Which was like, um, you know, like they had the benefit of like the largest framework, in, like the largest JS framework in the world, like, you know, pushing their stuff and, and really hyping them. And um, they're still like, you know, not, a huge factor in terms of the overall ecosystem. Um, I think that like like the the shift here, like if you're going to think about a new package manager for JavaScript, there has to be something more fundamental that's going to push people in that direction. And I think that that is this this native module experience that is now enabled in the browser. Um, like we we've been using modules in the browser through these compile chains for like ten years, so people haven't really noticed how different it is and how much the platform has caught up um, when you're doing things natively. Yeah. Um, oh, Dino. Yeah. Ryan. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've talked with Ryan a lot about Dino, actually. Um, Dino has some interesting ideas about package management um, and about how sort of modules should work. Um, it could be interesting. I think that, like most things in the browser, once you're working in the browser, you're now living in the constraints of the browser and uh, postulating about a lot of like things that could work that are that don't work at all in the browser today um, or would require like, you know, again, like an entire compile step or something like aren't all that interesting. One of the constraints in the browser is that like an import is going to turn into an HTTP call. Um, like that's always going to happen and that severely limits what you can do in terms of hooks and in terms of mutations in the module system. There is no like actual sort of hook infrastructure. There's a way for you to turn names into URL spaces. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you want to do something different with how that module is fetched, you can't manipulate it at the level of the import statement. You have to do it at the HTTP layer in the service worker um, or in the back end. It's like God. Uh, browser constraints are incredibly complicated and they're multiplicative so like when you layer one on another you're like <laughs> you're, you keep continue to box yourself into more and more of a corner um and none of the, the existing package managers like entropic or npm or really anybody are trying to live within the constraints of the browser all of them um come from from a node background like like me honestly um and so you're you're used to having this incredibly flexible um environment where you can literally do anything and then you can, you know, throw, run everything to a compiler and just sort of make it work in the browser. Um, it, things look very different once you, you live in this native space. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's a comment about XHR and when people realize that XHR could do things. That was a really important thing, though, because like people feel it, realize that XHR could do things right when Microsoft stopped developing a browser when they had dominant market share. So literally, like the only new things that happened in web development for like four or five years were with XHR and all of the kind of hacks on top of it. Um, and then, you know, Mozilla had to take enough market share away from Microsoft that um, actual like new things in the web platform could think about. So, yeah. Okay, I, I think uh, I'm done. Um, is there anything else? Um, I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind talking about um, experience with Beaker Browser. Um, um, Paul, who's building Beaker Browser, sort of arrived at this, e tried experimenting with ES modules um, a year ago. And it's, it's for the exact same reasons, like because it's like 
if you if you don't if you remove the bundler from the equation, it works really well with decentralized use case and uh, everything gets cached everywhere. It's it's, it's actually pretty awesome. Um, and I also wanted to point out another project from the DAT community, which actually works on IPFS uh, from Ranger Mob. He's doing the DAT 2.0. He's lead, leading that that. And uh, be before he he got that contract, um, he's working on this project. One of his little projects is called Web Run, and it allows you to run um, sort of unbundled yes modules for Node.js. They use the same modules that you would use in the browser, and you can put them on IPFS and run them, load them into Node or DAT. So, is this using a compiler to make them run in Node? Um, I think you, you, you're just you're basically taking modules that are written for the web first, mm -hmm. and it's a loader for Node, which loads them. I think it's a you know it's a bit like what Dino's doing, but it's using a you know DAT or IPFS. Interesting. Uh, so I'll have to dig into this. Okay, yeah. So he's got um, all these. Yeah, I'm actually going to meet him. He's going to be at the, the conference in Toronto, uh, the Our Networks thing. So, oh, I see. Hmm. I was like, this is this is interesting. So, so basically, he's doing like um, he's got a ton of polyfills for all the browser stuff, so that you can run most of the browser stuff in Node. Yeah. And then, I assume like unless he's using Node 12 with the, the experimental module flag, then he's probably loading them. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh wow. I think he um, done it a couple of times. Um, also, like in Beaker Browser, I think Paul's been just writing zero bundling for the past year. So all the the new code that's going into Beaker Browser is all been written in this style, mm -hmm. not using NPM modules. So, so one cool thing here, if you look at the syntax down down the way for um, importing from a DAT URL and from an IPFS URL, so you can do that in Node because Node has a hooks infrastructure. Um, in, inside of its um, like the, the new module syntax to do that. You can't do that in the browser, like they turn into HTTP URLs. But if we have a service worker installed, what you could do instead is just have an URL space that is like underscore IPFS or underscore dat, and then all of those get pulled out of the IPFS network and the dat network. Um, so you can you can do the same thing, it's just that the, the syntax looks a little different once you um, have to run it through the web worker. Yeah, I, I sort of mentioned that at the bottom in the future section too, which is like, if if you have this um, <laughs> the, the service worker that a lot of people are using um, in their apps, you can start to just sort of add other protocols, um, and you don't even have to really pollute the bundle. You can have all of that get loaded in dynamically once people request stuff out of those networks. So you can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, okay, so reproducibility of the dependency graph locks and bundlers. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to get into that because it gets like really, it gets really nerdy and really detailed. But um, effectively, uh, so because this is like an IPLD, the registry is an IPLD graph, and so the IPLD graph has like you know every name of every package, so a link to some metadata, and a link to it in a Unix FSV2 directory. Um, so that means that you know, the, the content for, the content and the metadata and everything is all hashed, right? And every release of that is all hashed. Um, so if you wanted to do something like a lock, for instance, you could really easily generate um, like a hash of, of that entire tree um, and then load, and then specifically load that hash. So you lock, like creating sort of lock infrastructure is, is really easy once we're on top of sort of, uh, once the, the registry is on top of this content address tree. Um, there's also some interesting stuff. So one of the problems that you have with ES modules is that um, if you're loading modules from different locations and you do an update, you could potentially get one of the old modules and one of the new ones, right? Like if you have the same thing if you just load a bunch of script tags and you just did a big push to the infrastructure, you, you could potentially wind up in a weird situation where people get like half of the resources for the new site and half of the ones for the old one, um, unless you have like really complicated infrastructure to solve that. But in this system, um, the registry has a single hash for the root node of the IPLT graph. So 
at the point that the application loads, we can actually lock the state of the registry and know that every dependency, like all the dependency resolutions are getting the right thing, even if you didn't explicitly lock it, right? Um, and then once an update happens, we can go and fill out all those updates and then also go from, like load the, the application again from the same state. So we, we can start producing like much better guarantees and much easier sort of lock states um, from, you know, it, once we have things, once the registry is content addressed, essentially. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really, really good stuff that we can do there. I'm, I'm like on the same train in terms of locking all the dependencies and, and everything um, and having all that functionality there. I had a hand on a slightly different topic um, where it just, I've, I think I'm subscribed to IPFS notes or something and um, noticed some movement in the last three days or so on um, a note about uh, IPFS and Nix integration, which was curious if folks um, had taken a look at. Um, it kind of, toward the end, turned, turned into more of a, a thought thought exercise around um, <clears throat> blockchain layers and, and using that as kind of a layer above these sorts of things. But um, there's like maybe a useful, a useful discussion to, to continue jumping on to see if there's kind of current movement on the Nix side and um, kind of any particular things they need from us. Seemingly there are some actively interested humans who might be worth reaching out to. No, I used Nix more than a decade ago, so mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it seems like a natural fit, like just because everything's uh, hashed. Um, hold on here, Stephen, are are you, you on the call? Yes, I'm on the call. Yeah, this comment that he has about a new CID format, which is just two CIDs smushed together, is there a yeah. reason why he why he can't just have a block that is two links and then link yes. to the block and you set CID? You okay, there isn't. Yeah, yeah. No. Why wouldn't, yeah. Uh, okay. but so <laughs> uh, he wants to have like pointer to the source and pointer to the, the code or something. Right, right. Yeah, no, but, just have a block, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think we need no, a CID format. I mean, ideally we'd have UnixFS uh, v2 or something like that where we can have metadata and then like you can have like uh, a binary that ends up also having like a metadata item that points to the source. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. No, this is definitely not a case where we'd want a second CID. For, like, that's not what a CID points to content. It doesn't. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is application specific. Yeah. Also, okay, okay. You, you really wouldn't want to have like, if you have two pieces of content that are like, not necessarily provably related, mm -hmm. then you want a signature there and not a hash because otherwise it's meaningless. Right, yeah, like right. I don't know how you compiled A into B, so I have no idea if these two things are actually the same or different things. Uh, well, it so signature. Nix does provide that sort of, or at least Quix does. I think Nix as well. Uh, or like it's trying to be uh, reproducible, so the build script tells you exactly how to get uh, the final output. Uh, so like you could, in theory, check it, and the idea is that people would check this, and like you get like. You would ask multiple parties, like, hey, what's the hash of this, these things? And then you'd get the final output. Um, but yeah, like, honestly, in this case, you should just like point to that just like a, or, you, know, you point to a, a Seaboard object that has these two pieces of information and then maybe other metadata. Uh, there's a lot of useful metadata you could shove into this block. Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I would, per, if it was me, I would prefer having like being able to accumulate collections of signatures of people who said, Yes, in fact, A does turn into B, because the idea is that I'm just going to use B without actually checking that it came from A most of the time. 
I think the idea here is that would be up to the package manager. That's how it currently works. Where like you have a set of trusted nodes, uh, everyone, uh, or sorry, a set of uh, trusted builders effectively, um, or something like that. I can't remember how it works. Actually, I think really you just trust a single builder. It's like every other distro. Um, so we're, I, I, I have that issue open about the updates to Unix SV1 adding file metadata. Well, it's adding file like permission data. It's all structured mm -hmm. right now. Um, should we add just like a generic string field that we don't say what it should be? So uh, that when people have to do. So like, I ideally mean, we'll, yeah, ideally it would be a, ideally we could just add a, an arbitrary CID, but we don't because everything is typed. We're we don't want to like we don't want to add a field just for this use case, and but we want to have something there so that when people do hacks, they're not like the worst hacks ever. Well, um, so in theory, we can just add a link to another object, um, and then make that other object a CPR object. You can stick whatever you want in it, or just make it whatever you want. You can stick whatever you want in it. So like we have a metadata field. It has the type CID that just points to anything. Um, the oh, yeah. the problem with this is I don't think we can do this just because of like these up and down go that we have hacks all over the place that assume that all of the links coming from files are pointing to blocks in the file. Um, for like mm. because we're using DAG protobuf, which is yeah weird. Uh, this is one of the other reasons we want to switch away from that. Yeah. All right. Um. I'll poke around this a little bit and see if maybe we can do something um, before I land those um, changes to the protobuf. So, cool. Beautiful. Good timing, everybody, because we're at time. So <laughs> continue the conversation. Um, any last, you have 10 seconds, you can say a thing. Otherwise, please drop off. All right, see you next time. Thanks, everybody.